Okay, welcome, welcome everybody. Good evening. Uh, uh, my name is Sergey Gurif. I'm provost at Sian Spo, and today we are very happy to welcome Ekaterina Schulman. Uh, judging by a number of people around, uh, around this room, uh, Ekaterina needs no introduction. Uh, yet, uh, I know that it's always nice to hear generous things about uh, speakers. So. Absolutely. I do need an introduction. It, that's the part of every lecture that I most enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Ekaterina Schulman today is a Robert Bosch Fellow in Berlin, uh, but before that, she's been uh, a very important, uh, uh, important public intellectual in Russia. Now she's a very important intellectual outside, uh, outside of Russia. She was an associate professor in the Russian uh, Academy for National Economy and Public Administration. Uh, she worked in the Institute of uh, Social. Uh, science, which is uh, somewhat uh, built on the same, uh, sp same spirit as Sian Spo. Uh, she was also working as a member of uh, the Council of Human for Human Rights uh, of uh, Russian President uh, in 2018-2019. Uh, she was an uh, Associated Fellow of Chatham House. Uh, but most importantly, she uh, was a star of uh, uh, Russian media to, uh, talking about political science and uh, and uh, and uh, democratic and non-democratic regimes. A lot of uh, what Russian public knows about democracy and non-democracy comes from uh, Ekaterina's uh, shows and books. She's an author of a book called Practical Politology, which is extremely popular. I see people around uh, the room uh, thinking that they will get a signature, a signed copy of uh, the, on this book. Uh, um, uh, Ekaterina, before uh, coming to academia, worked in uh, Russian parliament. Uh, that was 20 years ago, so it was a different parliament. Uh, um, uh, uh, even though she observed some of the figures who are still there. Uh, Ekaterina also worked in, in the private sector. She worked as a, uh, in public relations, government relations company, PBN, um, uh, in, in Russia. And uh, she, uh, has also, she has also introduced many uh, important concepts in Russian political discourse. One of the things I really appreciate as a scholar of non-democracy myself, Ekaterina was the author of, of uh, uh, Reverse Cargo Cult, uh, which is a very important uh, concept for understanding modern Russia. I'm sure Ekaterina will talk about issues like this, but just to, uh, to uh, say a few words about this for people who don't know how that works, uh, you know that cargo cult is when you uh, build a, a plane out of sand and you think it will fly. So uh, reverse uh, cargo cult is when you look at your plane built out of sand, which doesn't fly, and you think the real planes also don't fly. This is the story of Russian democratic institutions, which were sometimes uh, Potemkin democracies, uh, uh, democracies created artificially to imitate Western democracies, and eventually practicing those institutions, as Ekaterina correctly argued, uh, led uh, Russian uh, political figures uh, to believe that in the West there is no democracy as well. So, uh, without uh, further ado, I will give a floor to Ekaterina, who will talk about one hour. Um, uh, we, we know that Ekaterina, well, the real fans of Ekaterina know that she speaks fast. So if we have more time, because she speaks faster than uh, one hour, we'll have more time for questions. You know that this building uh, closes at nine o'clock. Uh, initially, we thought that we will, uh, um, we will be here until quarter to nine, and, um, and uh, we'll try to finish at quarter to nine, but if uh, there are questions, we'll, we'll, we'll be kicked out by the, by the apparitor, uh, by, people, by people who provide our security. So this, uh, this uh, lecture is recorded, so watch out when you ask questions. That applies to you, Katerina, as well. Absolutely. Uh, so please, uh, please think about uh, recording when you ask questions. And uh, if we are very lucky, Maybe Ekaterina will put it on her YouTube channel eventually, uh, which has more than one million followers, uh, which is actually twice as many as uh, her following on Instagram, which is only 600,000. Uh, so without further ado... I'm, I'm, I'm not on Instagram. 
That's what Wikipedia page says. Okay. Uh, maybe there is a fun account uh, uh, run by somebody else who, who is a fan of yours and it has uh, 600,000. I'm also not on Twitter, for the record. Okay. Uh, so it's probably a verified account of Ekaterina Schulman, which is not you. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, without further ado, uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, uh, start, uh, start the talk. Ekaterina will talk from the lectern, and I, I will, I will uh, put on your slides. Please go ahead. Let, let, uh, join, uh, please join me in the round of applause. Very good. Thank you, dear listeners, and thanks to uh, Sergei for this very flattering introduction, and generally for the great and rather intimidating honor of uh, being able to speak in one of the centers of European social thought, one of the leading universities in the sphere of social sciences to which my particular science, political science, belongs. So a few words uh, about myself as a scholar and about the lecture that I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, read to you. I am a political scientist specializing in legislative process, lawmaking, and therefore parliamentarism. Decision-making process is the uh, greater exponent of uh, legislative process, so I'm interested in decision-making as well, and therefore in bureaucracy, governmental apparatus, and its inner workings. This is, of course, connected to my own personal biography. As Sergei has said, I've been working as a civil servant for quite a number of years when I was younger, and when the Russian state was younger than it, than it currently is. So, um, from bureaucracies and political decision making to political regimes and regime composition and regime transformation and the factors driving or impeding these transformations is an easy and natural step. So uh, today I'll be um, trying to, so this is the not right slide, this is yeah. very last slide, now you'll see how many of them are there, but we'll definitely need to go to the first. <laughs> Uh -huh. And this is not the first. This is the first. Okay. This is slide number one. Yes, exactly. Uh, so, in this lecture, I'll try to cover two interrelated topics regime stability and the trajectories and changes in public opinion. So, we'll try to talk about the Russian state machine, its composition, its current status and health, the way it copes or fails to cope with the situation it has put itself in, and as I will try to explain, it is not very well adapted to. Then we will try to talk about whatever we can know about a public opinion in a non-free country under circumstances of military censorship and widespread, although still targeted rather than massive repression. Those two elements, contribute to, or I hope they will contribute, to our understanding of the political situation inside the country. I'm not an expert in anything that relates to foreign policy or military policy or international relations. During the last two years, we all are being forcibly re-educated into military experts, but I'm resisting that. So I'm trying to stay within my modest, but my own sphere of competence. Uh, a few more words uh, about the data I'm, I'm about to use. This is not the result of my own research. I use other people's data. I try to combine various sociological factors when we come to the uh, public opinion part, uh, I'll try to explain that and why I do that in attempting to form a more or less coherent picture. But this is just, this is not a presentation proper, this is just a collection of data, mostly statistical and sociological data, illustrating my uh, points. I'll try to tell which, uh, whom do I take this data from, so none of it is secret, none of it is my own invention or my own uh, individual research. I do not use insider sources, whatever these are. I do think that uh, we have enough information on the ground if we only know how to use it and how to combine it in forming, as I said, a more realistic picture of reality. As scholars, as scientists, we know that uh, complete truth is unavailable to us on this side of eternity. But we know that it exists and that we need to strive to get as close to it as we can. This is 
in a nutshell, the description of a scientific point of view to which we hope we belong. So, to our subject. What is Russian Federation as a political system or a political regime? Technically, we are a personalist autocracy. One of the questions that, uh, that has been asked during the last two years with great persistency is whether Russia has already transformed itself from its former authoritarian self into something more totalitarian. People tend to perceive our terminology, the terminology of political science, emotionally. We are not the only ones suffering from this. Psychologists have it worse. Their terminology is used by everybody and his dog in every sense rather than the correct one. But in our sphere, people quite correctly tend to assume that democracy is better than other political regimes. So when they see something they like, they call it a democracy. When they see something they like less, they call it an autocracy. But if it's very bad, then it's totalitarian. Or if you want to go full way, it's fascist. However, these terms are not just words expressing your attitude. They have actually a meaning of their own. So what I think we see is the country, or rather the political machine, that is trying to achieve a totalitarian transformation, but that is not so easy as it seems. Why? No political regime has a monopoly on violence or evil or even repression. Yes, totalitarian regimes tend to do it better than others. Their type of repressions, for example, is mass rather than targeted. And by the way, the difference is not in numbers per se, but in the rationale. Authoritarian repressions aim at intimidation. Totalitarian repressions aim at extermination. In an autocracy, they repress you for what you do or what they think you do, or what they accuse you of doing. In a totalitarian model, they repress you for who you are, for belonging to an entity, for a membership in a group. Why? Because totalitarian models have a picture of the future. The all valuable, beautiful future the paradise of tomorrow. So anyone or any group of people who are an obstacle or are perceived as an obstacle in, on the way to this paradise should be exterminated because the happiness of millions is at stake. Autocracies or authoritarian regimes have no other rationale whatsoever but preservation of power. This sounds simple. Every power wants to be preserved. Actually, the... Uh, the things that we are describing are not unique to totalitarian regimes or authoritarian ones. Do democracies present a picture of the future? They do, especially during election periods. It's hard to uh, come before the electorate and say, please vote for me, I'll keep things exactly as they are. You need to sell some image of the future. Uh, authoritarian regimes try to do it too, although they rather tend to sell stability, not change. We'll uh, mention that uh, when we come to uh, the public opinion changes, the changes in the public mood rather uh, than opinion. But autocracies are bad with the future. They do not have ideology. They do not have a complete picture of how humanity develops or should develop. It is not that easy to transform from autocracy to a totalitarian state. We know historical examples of weak democracies becoming totalitarian. Weimar Germany is the example, the textbook example. Or the weak and very short-lived democracy of the so-called February Russia. But there are much less examples of autocracies suddenly becoming totalitarian. First, you need an idea. An idea that, in the words of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, will take hold of the masses and become a physical force. Second, you need organizations. No totalitarian regime can exist without a party the one and only ruling party that permits or should permit all the stratas of society. Third, you need or, well, you don't need, but it is better for you, if you fancy a totalitarian transformation, to have a certain type of demographic situation. You need a lot of young people. 
At best, again, if you are planning for some reason totalitarian transformation, here's six easy steps to do that. Uh, the best moment is when you have high birth rates, a lot of young people, uh, some sort of economic growth, which makes a lot of people born in the countryside move to the cities. It sounds like a good picture of, of, of the future progress. It may be a good sign of future progress, but it is also a dangerous moment for an idea to get hold of the minds of these young and active and poor and ambitious people who have just been educated, learned to read and write, but nothing much. So this is the moment in Germany, in Russia, in China, when totalitarian ideas take hold. Do we see anything of the kind in the Russian Federation? Well, not yet. I do think that at least since February 2022, this totalitarian transformation has not happened, either with the state or with the society. I will try to show how political system, political machine, bent on self-preservation, tries to preserve itself as it is, as it wants to be. Even if this goal comes in contradiction with the military goal. Uh, the first slide uh, shows the uh, quality of governing, government effectiveness, according to Worldwide Governance, uh, governance Indicator. It's the data for 2020, so evidently uh, the computations were made before the COVID. Uh, and we can see that Russia is, well, as I think uh, Natasha Rostova has it uh, in, in war, war and Peace in the ballroom scene, she, she looked around and thought, uh, some, th there are some that are worse than us, there are some that are like us. So some are worse, some are rather like us. Есть такие же, как мы, есть и похуже нас. In Russian, it's a memorable phrase. Uh, so, the quality of Russian governance uh, was unequal. And this inequality has demonstrated itself, as it usually does, in the time of crisis. So, you see, we are better than Turkey, better than uh, some of the uh, post-Soviet countries. Of course, we are much inferior to the Scandinavians, these happiest of people who are always first in every rating, democracy, uh, gender equality, happiness, uh, whatever, they have it best. Uh, but we are on a par with Italy. Look at Italy. Uh, Southern Europe, again, we need not, we did not have need to be ashamed at that, at that moment of the comparison. Uh, the uh, World Bank is a bit more severe on us. So this is, the, uh, this is their um, assessment. You see, they didn't like us much in 2015. Uh, we did a little better in 2016, and then we went from bad to worse, and this is already 2022. I do not know what they said about us in 2000, this is 2021, in 2022, and I really don't want to, I don't want to look. Uh, but, as I said, uh, the quality of the Russian bureaucracy is unequal. And why am I talking about bureaucracy? I said we are a personalized autocracy. Personalized autocracies, by definition, are political regimes where power is concentrated in the hands of the leader and his closest surrounding. Personalist autocracies are unpopular with political scientists because even among autocracies, they are the most disinstitutionalized ones. There are party autocracies where the power belongs to a ruling party. There are military autocracies, the so-called juntas, or junti in Russian, again, in technical terms. Some uh, political scientists also classify the so-called traditional autocracies or monarchies. Among all those types, personalist ones uh, tend to dismantle or subvert or imitate institutions. Why? To consolidate power in the hands of a person. That's why they're called personalist. Therefore, they do it quite well. This consolidation of power is their strong point, but there's one drawback, and you might have guessed what that is. If you monopolize power in the hands of the person, that person is also subject to the laws of nature. So when something happens to him, and more rarely her, you are left with this disinstitutionalized, disinstitutionalized environment, and then the country needs to reinvent itself anew. Unlike with the party autocracies, 
Who can educate elites within the ranks of the party? Who can organize elite transition, elite rotation without losing power? Party autocracies last longer, but they are also easier to democratize. Personalist autocracies are very apt to be succeeded by another personalist autocracy. Why? For self-evident reasons, because they leave no institutional inheritance. So there's nothing to build upon, but there's a certain tradition that there exists a leader, and so he should be the power in the land. Among personalist autocracies, Russia in peculiar in being what I would call an atatist one. We are generally an atatist country, the statist society. Power belongs to the bureaucracy. This began well before the Soviet Socialist Revolution. I'm not a fan of either historical parallels or of attributing everything to traditions. Societies change, people change, people are adaptable creatures. That's the one thing we should know about human nature. It's infinitely adaptable. But all the same, I must say that uh, power being vested in the Chinovnichestva in the official dom, rather than in the aristocracy of birth, is the peculiar feature of Russian brand of feudalism, of Russian brand of monarchy, the power of the place. As the Russian saying has it, Miesta krasit chilaveka, the place beautifies a man rather than the other way around. So the rank rather than birth was important for Russian society since the time of the first Romanovs, at least. And since Peter I, it became the paramount importance. Gradations of rank were the Bible of Russian nobility. And this nobility, again, was not based on birth. It was based on rank. And rank, of course, can be assumed. It can be granted. And then it can be taken back. So this gives a lot of power to the centralized authority as well. In Soviet Russia, power also belonged to what is called nomenklatura. And this, I think, is the term that Russian language has uh, presented to uh, every other language in the world. Nomenklatura is this class of broadly understood bureaucracy. It has ever been the same with post-Soviet Russia. There are brilliant research articles and papers out there showing how in post-Soviet times this same nomenclatura has not ceded power but has preserved it. Rather, people have risen from third and second ranks to the first, but elite change has not taken place. I must say here that elites tend to reproduce themselves in every society, unless you have a bloody revolution and you kill them off, then the children of the well-to-do will be highly likely to be well-to-do as well. Uh, children of university professors have a much higher capacity of becoming university professors themselves. It's the same with the administrative class. There is also research about, uh, I have recently read it, it's fascinating, it's a research on the victims of cultural revolution in China, and it says that even when people were killed, their grandchildren tend to occupy the same rank in, in society as their grandparents. So after one generation, social status is restored. Again, even in the case of people being actually killed. So we would assume their social capital has been nullified, but there's no such thing. Again, it's not a 100% rule, but it's rather a tendency. So, as I said, in Russia, power belongs to this broadly understood generalized bureaucracy. This bureaucracy can be federal, regional, and local by level. It can also be civic and armed. There's a civil bureaucracy, and there's the great community of Siloviki, another of our international words. I think apparatchik is another one. I have read it in, I think, Washington Post describing a person in Zimbabwe saying that he's a notable apparatchik. So th this has also become international. So, you have law enforcement, security services, military bureaucracy, um, these people who are, as I said, generally described as Siloviki, all this is bureaucracy. 
With all the popular comparisons of Russian president with the Tsar and of his surrounding as a court, we do not really have the features characteristic of monarchies. We do not have favorites. We do not have great eminences. Everybody who is anybody is anybody because of a position. People who are important in Russian system of power are heads of ministries, heads of governments, heads of state corporations, heads of state banks, etc. Some of them do not have official positions, but they are the so-called Putin's oligarchs or kings of state procurements. In this, they are different from the Yeltsin era oligarchs who were granted propriety of assets. But Putin era oligarchs, they get state procurements. They sell something to the state or do state orders, which is extremely lucrative. It gives them a lot of money, but I have heard some of them complain. Well, not exactly. It's not that some of the Kovalchuk brothers uh, complained to me about anything. But I had it from a middle rank oligarch. This very curious complaint that has kind of stuck with me that under Yeltsin, you could get property. But here, now, you kind of can sit at the table, eat whatever you want, but you can't take anything home. <laughs> and like I said, you cannot leave the table not even for natural reasons, which kind of creates a tense atmosphere. I think it's kind of a good uh, picture uh, of the situation. So this slide uh, shows attempts at computation of how many people work for the Russian state as, again, militarized bureaucracy or as civil bureaucracy. What is important, though, I think you have already been able to read the slide while I was talking, but what is important is not the level, but the trend. And here's the trend. Uh, this is the, again, approximate computations of a number of people in civil, just civil state service, in thousands. This graph um, ends in 2013, which is unfortunate because, and here you'll have to, uh, you, you'll have to take my word for it, after 2014, a great increase in the number of state servants, direct or indirect, like people working for state corporations, happened, especially on the regional level. Among the regional branches of federal services, ministries, and agencies. Why was that? Here's another. Ah, OK, we'll come to that. Why did this happen? After 2014, or rather after 2012, having experienced wide-scale protests and something even resembling an attempt at power change, Russian political system survived by doing two things. One is evident, the other is not so evident. Actually, political science tells us that if there is an unsuccessful coup against any regime and, and the coup is unsuccessful, then two things happen. Repressions, of course, it's a knee-jerk reaction. Somebody rebelled against you, they failed, you punish them. But there's the second. You need to extend and strengthen your support base. So you have to punish the rebels, but you have to buy loyalties. So we have seen the repression campaign. Balotna affair, uh, new laws on foreign agents and such like, a reformation of administrative code, the empire of fines, as the defunct Gleb Olegovich Pavlovsky used to call it, Imperia Strafov. Uh, this whole set of, uh, this whole toolbox of new repressive policies. But there also came the second part, buying of loyalties. Increase in a number of people who work for the state. And also, there came in 2014 another quite successful attempt to buy loyalties, Crimea, this great present to the Russian people, the New Year present of their dreams, the island of their childhood. This is what they liked a lot for whole three years. For three years, the so-called Crimean consensus or Crimean euphoria held on. But there was also this buying of loyalties, which is important when we later come I hope we do, to the promised trajectories of public opinion. These people who work for the state, who are the budgetary workers, not budgetary workers in the sense of teachers and um, doctors, these are much worse off, but people who are civil servants, who work for corporations, state banks, state media, they are well off. Their incomes are stable. 
they are regularly indexed because of inflation or just because something. They have this stable and safe situation, and this ensures their attachment to the status quo. When we come to the support of the so-called special military operation, please keep this in mind. By the end of 2010s, the state has become the, if not the dominant job giver, at least a very important one. The economy became much more statified, but not fully, and this saved the situation in 2022, we'll remember that also, but still. So how effective is this big state machine? It's a curious question, and it's a difficult one because as maybe in every informational autocracy, but especially in Russia, there's a distinct conflict between appearances and reality. When the war came, this huge stress test for any system, it appeared quite soon that those parts of it that it has most prided itself on, identified itself with, spent most money on, has failed it. Either immediately, like the military intelligence, secret services, and the military itself, or after some time, like the great and rich propaganda machine, which was quite successful during the first months of the hostilities, but starting the end of summer 2022, it has failed to uh, create and deliver a coherent message. We will come to the figures of TV consumption and generally media consumption later on, so you will see what I mean. It hasn't failed miserably, but it has, I don't think they got uh, the, the song for their money. But what bits of it, what bits of that machine has shown themselves to be resilient and effective and has actually saved the date? Those very parts which were always suspect for being liberals at heart, a potential fifth column, uh, pro-Western, etc. The civic bureaucracy, especially financial economic bloc, financial economic authorities, a regional bureaucracy, private business, banking sector, those parts of the economy which remained more or less market economy. And they created this resilience by their great adaptability. By very rough computations, one third of Russian economy is state, one third is private business, one third is gray zone. And by gray zone, we do not mean anything criminal. We just mean a type of low level entrepreneurship which is not on the radars of state statistics. State statistics are in a bad way. I could complain a lot about it. I will only say one thing. Uh, there was a general census in 2021, and it has failed completely. It was a disaster for a number of reasons. Again, I will not go into details because it's, uh, it's such a pain of my heart that I could go on too long with it. But, you know, we social scientists, we live on data. And actually, governmental decisions are based on data as well, especially on the data of general census, and that is absolutely non-reliable. So we are in a situation where, frankly, we do not know how many people live in Russia. <laughs> Ridiculous, isn't it? And I'm not talking about new territories, the so-called new territories, which are situated no one knows where, which has no borders, no list of people, no nothing. I'm talking about proper Russia. Again, even excluding Crimea. Regional statistics are peculiar, especially when we come to the so-called national republics. There's every reason to believe that um, life expectancy and birth rates there are slightly exaggerated. Every regional governor has incentive in making his region appear more populous than it actually is for self-evident budgetary reasons, you know, yes? Uh, you will understand it if you were in his place too. So some evil-minded demographers even say that uh, currently the population of Russia is not 140, 42 millions, but rather I think Alexei Raksha has uh, one, 130, and some people say 100 million or 110. Again, it's like we're talking about an Assyrian empire we have very approximate computation. So that was my litany. Uh, yes, the, the, <laughs> the sad tale of a social scientist. So now we're coming to the effectiveness. Hmm? Yes, we'll try to. Uh, 
this data, again, it stops in 2012. This we owe to uh, a special department of presidential administration, who used to, which used to publish the so-called control and revision of the control uh, department. They used to publish these rates of implementation and non-implementation of presidential assignments. Presidential assignments are things that the president writes on, on papers. They are not presidential decrees, but they are presidentsky poruchenia. So the direct way of the president to address bureaucracy and make it do something. Starting 2012, they have suddenly stopped publishing this data, maybe in order not to scare us with the utmost effectiveness of our governmental machine. But we have no data. But again, implementation, non-implementation. But still, thanks to the Prime Minister Mishustin and his passion for digitalization, digitalizing everything. We have this thing that emerged in public in 2020. He, when he became Prime Minister, he, shortly afterwards, he ordered a survey of how the ministries implement presidential decrees. See the difference. These were presidential assignments and these are actual decrees. Ukaze. So, what is curious? I will try to translate it for non-Russian speakers. What is curious about this list? On top are those ministries which do worse in implementing those presidential decrees. At the bottom, those who do best. Look at this top and bottom. The worst offender is the Minister of Finance. They seem to ignore the president altogether. Uh, second, the Minister of Economic Development, then the Minister of Transportation, the Minister of Trade, the Minister of Culture for some reason, the Ministry of Healthcare. Look at the bottom uh, state uh, space agency, known for its success in conquering the universe. Uh, the Ministry of the Development of Far East, also quite a champion in its sphere. Uh, Ministry of Justice, my favorite one, the holder of the Register of Foreign Agents and then the Ministry of Defense. So there's a curious correlation here. On top, we have those very governmental bodies that have proven the most workable in an emergency. At bottom, those that have proved least effective. Is it really a correlation or is it just a chance coincidence? I do not know. But maybe there's something about bureaucratic discipline and the readiness to implement whatever the president says that comes in contradiction with the ability to actually do things in real life. Or then maybe it's just my assumption. So, what was my point when I started to describe our type of political regime? I said it was based very much on window dressing, make-believe, intimidation, producing false impressions, etc. It was good at some things. It did logistics quite well. Digitalization went smoothly enough. It has shown its dark and bitter side quite recently to the Russian people with this new law on conscription. But before that, they quite enjoyed it. You may have heard or you may have made this customary complaint of a Russian in Europe yourself. Everything is so slow here. No services to speak of. Internet is slow and expensive. They have not heard of FinTech. And the banking system? Nothing to speak of. So now we see the dark side of all those successes, but successes were there as well. Uh, our bureaucracy was extremely good at managing the banking sector and again doing the microfinancial, uh, the macrofinancial policy. I hope Sergei Maratovich agrees with me. I'm quite shy uh, in speaking on such subjects in such a presence, but still, this is my assessment. It was also good, the bureaucracy was good at organizing big public events like Olympics. They also had the dark side, but still we could put on a good show. So you, you have this system, which politically stands on atomization and depolitization of the citizens. It's the basic authoritarian social contract. You do not meddle in our affairs, which is power and money. You leave it to us. In exchange, we do not meddle with your affairs, which is surviving and doing whatever pleases you best. This is, again, the basic authoritarian contract. This is what makes the totalitarian transformation so difficult. When you have successfully depoliticized your people for 25 years, you cannot just 
at the drop of a hat, make them into one column united in common purpose. But this machine, as a state machine, is also not very good at direct war confrontation. It's rather good at organizing parades. And this whole special military operation is such a good term because this, this is what it had to be, a special operation with a slight military component. Fast, effective, good to show on TV, a pre-election something on the Crimean model, but in a larger scale. I was told by a couple of military analysts to whom I do not belong, but whom I trust maybe because of my dilettantism, that the Kiev plan itself was not bonkers. Again, military speaking, it could have succeeded in certain circumstances, but it didn't, for whatever reasons. We are not coming to that now. So the system found itself in a situation, as I said, which it was not prepared for and which it was not made for. So now we have this specific and self-contradictory picture of this whole system, not just the state, but the whole political system, political model, trying to pretend, using all its resources to pretend that nothing much is happening, that things go on as usual, to send this message to the people. At the same time, it feels the necessity of sending another message, that it's actually a great patriotic war all over again, that we need to stand up and, and have our share in forging the general victory, and this whole thing. It does not produce much of an impression. When we come, I hope we do come, to the state of public opinion, you will see how it works or fails to work. But first and foremost, one thing that we need to say before we come to any polling data. There are two questions which are usually asked about public opinion in a non-free society, any non-free society. First, how can we know what people really think? And second, does it really matter what they think? Both questions deserve to be considered. Yes, in a society where, the, where neither a respondent nor a pollster is free, expressing of an opinion is a complicated matter. This is the table of response rates. I know that low response rates is a curse in any country which tries to do polling. 20% response rate in the United States is considered tolerable, which means that 80% refuse to talk. And many people stop talking when questions become political. So they agree to say how old they are or where they live or what is their earning, earnings, but when you come to ask them political questions, they cancel the, uh, the interview. They just stop talking. So it's not peculiar to Russia, it's not peculiar to non-free societies, but in a situation of actual military censorship, when you know that a wrong answer can land you for 15 years in a penal colony, it tends to consolidate public opinion wonderfully. <laughs> which again, should be no surprise to anyone. How we deal with this situation, we, the people who try to study society, First, we cannot rely on any single indicator. Second, we cannot afford to ignore any single indicator. We watch them all. We try to combine them. We cannot say, I'm not using FTOM data because they are pro-Kremlin, or I'm not using Levada because they are foreign agents. What we try to do is to combine political answers to political questions with answers to non-political questions, like consumer optimism and consumer behavior, like plans for the future, or lack of plans for the future, like what do you feel, what are people around you feeling? So by, and we also try to combine information about answers to questions with information about actual behavior. People may say, that they're optimistic about the future economically, but for some reason, they tend to significantly lower their purchase activity. Or they may say that they are extremely supportive of the state policies and they feel pride for their countries, but then the champions of uh, sales in books is uh, uh, Viktor Frankl uh, and uh, Orwell uh, and uh, Kafka. So I feel so optimistic that I'll go and buy a book about surviving in a concentration camp because I, re I really feel too optimistic. I need to somehow balance my mood. That is evidently the idea. 
So these are the sad and shocking figures of the lowest of the low response rates. These are by an independent sociological service called Russian Fields. Uh, Russian, yes, Russian Field, Ruskaya Pole. Uh, I would recommend it to your attention together with another project, Chroniki, the Chronicles. I will use their data later. Uh, during 2022, such projects, independent sociological polling projects, emerged in the most unfriendly of environments, but they managed to conduct phone surveys or even offline surveys, which is invaluable in the sense of the data they produce. So people refuse to talk. People refuse to answer political questions. There's such a thing as a spiral of silence. And I will try to explain this concept in a few words because it's often incorrectly understood. People think that a spiral of silence means that a person has one opinion but is afraid to express it and so says the opposite thing. Actually, it, it's not like that. Most people, and no, we're not off record here, but still, most people have no political opinions at all. <laughs> they shouldn't really have them. They don't need them. Political agenda has little or no connection with their everyday life. So whenever a person gets asked a question, he or she needs to create the opinion on the spot. So what is the question? And if you think you are different, no, you're not, and I'm not different. We are social animals, Aristotle told us. We want to be approved by, uh, by our fellow creatures. We want to look good in their eyes. We want to be with the majority. We want to follow the norms. Again, it's absolutely normal. This is what allows peaceful cohabitation of people in society. We are all very much individual, etc., but still we tend to want to join the majority. So when you get asked the question, you ask yourself, what, is the, what do I think? I think what is right, and what is right? Right is what other people think, and what do they think? And here comes what is called confirmation bias. You try to recollect the latest thing you heard on the subject, assume that it's the opinion of the majority and therefore repeat it to be on the right side. And what is the latest thing you've heard if you are a Russian being asked political questions? It's something from TV that you heard for 15 minutes in the evening when this TV set was talking in your kitchen. So this must be the right answer. This is what all people think. Why is it called this spiral of silence? Because like every spiral, it extends. You give the so-called correct answer and join the imaginary majority that you have just constructed in your head. And then it becomes one people bigger, one bigger with one person, which is yourself. And other opinions are being silenced, not because people hold them but are afraid to express them, but because they do not hear them. Therefore, they cannot hold them. Autocracies know that. They do not know it. They sense it by their great survival instinct. So this is why these figures seem to me important. Um, about people thinking different things. The one and only sociological data that you hear most quoted is the so-called presidential rating, the great and sacred rating, the basis of the regime. Actually, there are three varieties. Of, pres of what we call a presidential rating. And one of these varieties is in turn comes in, in two forms. So there's the approval rating. Answer to the question, do you approve of what the president is doing as a president? These are all, always the highest figures. And you hear them cited most often. In psychological terms, it's a kind of agreeing with reality. So you know there's a president, you agree to that, well, yes, no use denying it. This is the approval of action, the approval of activity, uh, the approval rating. Then there's electoral rating. Would you vote for that person if elections were next Sunday? We have stopped getting those figures since 2019. The uh, Public Opinion Fund stopped doing this research in 2019. Tsuom stopped it immediately after the uh, presidential elections, and Levada is forbidden to do it because they are foreign agents. So we just do not have the answers. And there's the rating of trust, and it comes in two forms. The so-called open question and closed question. The closed question is, comes when you are presented with a list of names and told to choose whom of them do you trust. 
The open question is when you ask a question, when you are asked whom among the political figures you trust, and you have to come up with the name. Confirmation bias works there also because, of course, you try to desperately to recollect whom do you know among the politicians. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's this guy, he's been around for a long time, so I definitely know his name. But the trust ratings, and especially the open question trust ratings, are always the lowest. So what is this graph? Uh, it's the presidential ratings of trust and approval. It comes from FTOM, which is the most pro-Kremlin of all the pro-Kremlin sociological agencies. Uh, so I'm sorry for the color palette, it's, it's confusing, but uh, the light gray is approval of activity, and the darker gray is trust open question. So look, in the 10 years ago time, we were closer together. And then starting 2014, they began to diverge. As they say in the Russian internet, oh, and what has happened? <laughs> so something evidently happened in 2014. And you see how they went further and further from each other. But this is nothing in comparison to 2021 and later. Look at that. So you absolutely approve of what the president is doing, but you do not trust him. How goes? When we study sociological data coming from Russia, we come at this time after time. Again, putting aside all the actual figures, there's one feature that I see repeated. We, we're, it's like we are looking at a data coming from person or people who do not know or cannot tell their own mind. There are certain constant contradictions. We feel pride for our country and we feel anxiety like never before. We express consumer optimism and we lower our spending rates. We say that um, we, have, we do not really economize on spending, and we know that consumer activity has been lowered. So it's a kind of, like you're looking in a broken mirror. I will not say that we are dealing with a society which is in psychological crisis or has lost its mind or whatsoever. These are not scientific terms, I wouldn't be using them. But it is certainly a society that doesn't know itself has illusions about itself, does not see the connection between the views it expresses and the actual behavior patterns it pursues. This whole lecture, this whole explanation is descriptive rather than analytical. If you think I have the answers to the question how stable is the regime, how long it will survive, no, I do not. What I try to do is to and we have so little time, we are dealing with such basic transformations, such strong societal currents, and of course we are asked for answers like 15 minutes after everything has happened. But we are really dealing with a very complex entity. Some of my colleagues, social scientists, even say that we should, be, we should not be talking about Russian society as a whole. There is no such thing as Russian society. We'll come to that a bit later when we come to the question which everyone asks, support for the special military operation. But first, institutional trust. Russia is known as a country of extremely low trust rates. Speaking about trusting the president, Russians don't trust anybody. Institutional trust is low and interpersonal trust is low as well. This is one of the curses of our society because of course low levels of trust are classic obstacles to development. You do not trust your neighbors, you do not engage in business activity, or your business activity is costly. You pay unseen tax for every social transaction. Because if you don't have a trust, you need guarantees. So you keep an army of lawyers, policemen, notaries, etc. You need guarantees at every step. This prevents economic growth, it prevents development. 
it's sad and curious to see, for example, in Kazakhstan, my second favorite country, uh, in polls, uh, the difference between the Kazakh and the Russian population. The Kazakh population have higher trust levels. And, which is even sadder, uh, people in the same group, economically speaking, with the same level of incomes, when they are Kazakh, they put themselves in the group, we deny ourselves nothing. And when Russians, they say, we have scarcely enough to eat. And money is the same. The region is the same. These people are neighbors, but their self-assessment is so different. We Russians, we are a sad nation. So, coming back to institutional trust, trust towards institutions. Uh, year after year, Levada Center has been conducting those polls, so they have the so-called long lines now, of data, which is the most valuable thing any sociological service can possess, because, again, not the level, but the trend, not the statics, but the dynamics are important. No figure is important in itself, but only in comparison. So, we have had for decades three most trusted institutions. The great conservative triad. The president, the church, and the army. Sounds like the description of Frankist Spain or something of this kind. Uh, again, paints a picture of this hyper-conservative society, which, again, is not corroborated by social reality. But still, here they are. Uh, the, the president you have seen on the previous slide. So here we have the army, which is uh, the blue line. The red line is the uh, Russian Orthodox Church. And the violet line is the media, the lowest. So you see that the church is going down. Uh, this, uh, this graph ends with uh, November 2022. So it's already well into the special military operation. And look at the army. Look at it. It went down since the middle of 2021 when there was no war. So again, contrary to appearances, people have, they still trust the army. They still think that whatever our defects are, we do have the second army in the world. This is seen as a kind of beneficial side of the governmental policies because Russians do not trust the government. They do not think that reforms, any sort of governmental reforms or actions are in the interests of the people. We have also polling data about this, but at least we have the army. But even trust in the army went down and the, the church is not doing well. And again, interestingly, the media went up a little bit in the beginning and middle of 2022. So, no, you don't say that. 10 minutes. Okay, I'll try to. Uh, coming to the special military operation per se, what do we know from the very scarce and problematic data that we have? I think now it's a kind of an, an agreed conclusion among the sociological uh, services and the scholars who study public opinion, that we have three groups of comparable size in a society. Strictly pro-war, strictly anti-war, and the opportunists, the great and omnipowerful opportunists who always join the winning side, and whichever side they join wins. So, we have one-third of the people who think that war should definitely go on, they, how, how do you compute this? A person has to approve the beginning of the operation, think that it has to continue, and there's a radical group within this radical group who disag would disagree with the president were he to sign a peace agreement. So those how, who are more warlike than the president. But mostly, Society consists of, as I said, the loyalists, the supporters of status quo. Uh, so this is, this is the uh, data uh, showing, it, it was end of September, beginning of October 2022. Uh, these are the people who would support any decision, whichever. Uh, those are the military radicals, more special military operation. Those are the uh, people who are sure that we need a peace agreement. Next, uh, next to uh, two figures, rather for peace than for a new march on Kiev. The next, not sure about peace, would rather, rather support a march on Kiev. 
So you see, one third, one third, one third, but I do suspect that the militarized third is going rather down. The anti-war is not going up, I can say that. But the current idea is that responsibility should rest with the authorities. The general idea seems to be, could be formulated like this. You started this, you had your reasons, we trust you because you have told us that it's not our business. So maybe you know better, you deal with it, you'd better finish it because we would prefer it over when we come to um, questions of what is it that you don't like about a special military operation. Well, what's not to love, of course. Uh, the most popular answer is it's been going on for too long. People did expect it to be fast and brilliant. And when they, this didn't materialize, they were kind of not disappointed, but they are still expecting some finale. So, this is the uh, rates of people who think that Russia should have started this special military operation, the red line, should not, green, I do not know, blue, oh, blue, yellow, it's yellow. Look at the end of this graph. It's November, middle of November, 2022. This dotty line is mobilization, which dealt a huge shock to the public mind. We, now we can safely affirm that for the majority of the people, September 21st was what February 24th was for the educated classes. Before that, they did not really understand that anything out of the way is actually happening. We will not uh, deal with it from a moral point of view. We are just stating the fact. And now, again, some time having elapsed, we can affirm that that was and remains the fact. This new thing with the electronic conscription is another shock. I'll come to a really heartbreaking figures of anxiety or uh, calmness. Uh, in, the, in the public mind, and then you will see that here we just should see, see the yellow line going up sharply and the red line going down. That's the end of 2022. Uh, this is the same figures, but with a difference of age. When we come to the factors determining a person's attitude towards special military operation, the single most important factor, the one that le leaves Everything else behind is age. I do not know if there's another such historical example. This is the war which is mostly supported by the 60 plus. War should be the exercise for the young, a career lift, a glorious opportunity. Let the boy win his spurs. As English king said about his son, Edward the Black Prince. He did, but he died in the process. But as the, the popular song has it, Vaina Dela Maladich, Likarstvo Protiv Marshin, war is business for the young, medicine against wrinkles. And here we have the war which is actively disliked by anyone below 40. So 45 plus, they just love everything that happens. They support the authorities, they are extremely radical in their attitudes towards military action. And they are, by fortunate coincidence, also those least likely to be engaged in any active warfare. So again, what's not to love? So this is the proof of what I have just said. Age, age, the most important factor. The second most important factor is income. But not in the way you would think. The more well-to-do support the war more. The poorer, less. And now we'll have to come back to the state as the bread giver of the nation. When we speak about middle class in Russia in strictly economic terms, in terms of income and consumer behavior, we should understand that most of this middle class are state servants. They are people who have established guaranteed income, stable position. They are wedded to the status quo. Their loyalties are with the status quo, so they support everything. The poorer people have it harder. 
Although it must be also noticed that the payments to the mobilized and to the contractniki, the contract military workers, are unprecedented in the history of Russian state relations with the people. The state has never paid its people so much money. Never, ever. For their work, for their life, for their death, whatever. So when Rostad, the untrustworthy Rostad, uh, has declared that uh, in 2022 the levels of poverty in Russia has gone down, I do suspect they may be close to truth here because there was indexation of pensions, there were additional payments to families with children. Previously, it was only about poor families with children, now it's to anybody. So the authorities know what they are doing. They are buying loyalties. They say, yes, there's this special military thing, but it's not actually a war. It's done by special people. And if you decide to engage in it, you will get paid and even if you get killed, your families will get payments and benefits. It's not just money. It's the whole system of social guarantees for the families. For example, a child can enter any university without exams. So yes, maybe you will not survive, but your family will be taken care of forever. You will serve them by your death as you could never serve them by your life. There's another side to this too. Speaking about traditional values, we are the country for divorce rates. We do not do family life very well. We have sky high levels of unpaid alimonies. So fathers just don't pay. And we have this very often uh, happening situation when the family consists of a grandmother, mother, and the children. Russian family is the woman and her children. Men can come and go, they do not make much of a difference. And now, and now, imagine the situation. When you have this male member of your family, who is not of much use, frankly. <laughs> um, he may be mistreating you. He may not be earning much. You have to take care of him. Well, he grants you the status of the proper family, but not much else. And now suddenly, you can sell this commodity for money, such money as you have never seen. Talking about patriotic duty. So what we call the traditional Russian matriarchate, a very specific form of it, has taken a much, much darker side recently. This is what social reality looks like. That's why it's so worthwhile to actually study it. So such things do not come as a surprise to you. As I said, we are a society that doesn't know itself. Talking about patriar patriarchy and things. So, age, income, to a lesser extent, people in bigger cities like it less. People in smaller places more, unless they are poor. If they are poor, they don't like it. So, this is the same thing, but explained in, in more detail non-support of the war, younger age, information consumption, media consumption, very important sources of information, internet or TV, experiencing economic hardships or expecting economic hardships. These are the factors that uh, affect your support or lack of support for the operation. And this is one of my favorite graphs. Look at it. Uh, You see, social sciences are so amusing. <laughs> what are you laughing at, dear comrades? So this is form, the foundation of public opinion. The question is, and look, look at the question, because it's a, very, it's a very good one. I'll explain why. What mood, in your opinion, prevails today among your relative friends, colleagues, etc.? calm or anxious? So why is it good? Because they do not ask people, what do you feel? When you ask how you feel, you say, I'm fine. I'm absolutely fine. Everybody else is panicking, but I'm just stable as a rock. <laughs> but if you get asked about your surrounding, then you answer in a more realistic fashion. So uh, green is calm, orange is anxious. September 2022, mobilization. Again, not 
Special military operation, that was nothing much, but mobilization was a huge shock, as I said. Then things went a little, became a little bit calmer, and in the end of, uh, in the end of uh, 2022, people seemed to think that maybe things will be all right. Then we have another spike in the end of December, beginning of uh, January. What that is, maybe it's the Makievka accident. Maybe it's something that happened in the front line at that time. Maybe it's the lack of the traditional presidential press conference that has uh, uh, <laughs> made people so anxious. Or maybe it's the style of uh, New Year uh, congratulations which he decided to, uh, to publish. But now we have Look at the last of these days. This is, what is it? April, April. You see the green line goes above the orange line. So people have kind of calmed down. And today, later in the evening, we are expecting the next installment of data from the foundation of public opinion. And we will see how this whole electronic thing has affected or failed to affect the populace. So I'm, when I'm over with this lecture, I'll go and then Google it. Uh, or, or rather, I'll have it sent to me by my kind friends in Russia. Bless them. One more thing that I want to attract your attention to. I was trying to describe a society that doesn't know itself well. When we come to uh, graphs showing financial consumer optimism. We have the same picture, which I would, if I were not afraid of using such terminology, I would term it hysterical. Look at this. It looks like a cardiogram of a person with a heart attack. <laughs> One piece of news comes, and they are going through the roof. Another piece of news comes, they are euphoric. You can, I think you can relate to this feeling. It's like in a horror movie. First, you, you expect something very bad to happen, and then it doesn't happen. You have this huge feeling of relief, which is almost erotic. Oh, thanks God. The walking dead has not walked my way. <laughs> it's not normal. This whole thing is not normal. These are the answers to the questions, what do you feel about your country? Uh, we'll have a more detailed slide the next one, but this is just about two feelings, anger, uh, horror, shame, depression, uh, panic, etc. So all the bad things. And red line, all the good things. Joy, pride, uh, inspiration, etc. So look at that. Uh, March 22, we were kind of proud. And then for some reason, we ceased being proud. And in March of 23, we feel, and, and by the way, do you notice that uh, the sum makes up for more than 100%? <laughs> so you see, one person, 10 feelings. <laughs> Contradictory answers. A society in a state of, I don't know how to call the state. I have to come up with a definition. So that's, that's, a, more, uh, that's a more detailed one. Uh, it's specifically about your feelings on military actions, Russia's military action in Ukraine. So it's anger, shame, depression, anxiety, fear, horror, shock, uh, joy and contentment, inspiration, pride, something else, no feelings. This is, this is, according, to, this is according to Levada. So you see pride is the most popular answer because it's the safest one. The second most popular, shock and horror. By the way, another factor which influences what people say, we don't know what they think, at least what they say. Males like it more than females. Women like it slightly less, unless they are over 60. If you are over 60, you are just so optimistic. <laughs> no one can be compared to you in this respect. Uh, now, this is the one that I also like. Uh, assessment of uh, financial position of one's family. Is your family's financial position going to get, in your estimation, better during the next 12 months or worse? Better green, red, uh, worse. So we experience the levels of consumer optimism unprecedented in the Russian modern history. So people are just so enthusiastic. 
about Russian economy. They just stop buying things, they are so enthusiastic. <laughs> Again, how do we explain it? Maybe it's giving a, sad, a safe answer because it's one of the staples of state propaganda that we have fought and defeated the sanctions. We have kept our economy standing in the face of unprecedented pressure from above, abroad, from the outside. So again, it, it's one of the fundamentals of the state discourse. So when you're asked, do you really feel like your financial affairs are going to get way better in the next 12 months, you say, yes, of course, why not? So, last, frankly, I promise, this is the last, but it's important because it's media consumption. We remember from one of the last slides that an important factor driving a person's opinion and therefore supposedly behavior, although that's not a simple thing in autocracies, opinions are not directly converted to behavior. And even support for protests is not converted directly into protest behavior. Pollsters know that. But media consumption is an important influencing factor. The elder strata, which we have described in such glowing colors, com consumes news mostly from TV. Not exclusively, they are also on the internet. And by the way, this is a thing that happened during COVID. When the elderly went online because they had to, you could not survive unless you were online. Their children connected them by force or they managed to find their way to Adnaklasniki. Uh, <laughs> but they went online and I was telling when I was reading lectures about changes brought on by the pandemic that they are there to stay, which proved to be very true. By the way, they are the great users of Gosuslugi of the late and brilliant memory, how we used to enjoy it, what a good service it was, now no longer. So, uh, this is the coverage of main TV channels in Russia. It's 2001, 2002. The situation during the special military operation very much resembles the one in the beginning of the pandemic. In spring of 2020, we had a huge spike, a big spike in TV consumption, even among those age stratas that did not consume TV information previously. The peak was in April and May. So people just went watching TV. It lasted for like eight weeks. Then they went away again. So even with the people locked at home, tied to their chairs, forced to watch TV, TV could not hold their attention. Actually, the process of state TV, and there is no other TV uh, in Russia, losing audiences has been going on since 2016. It was one of the signs of the erosion of the aforementioned Crimean consensus. I was curious, by the way, when it started and when it became noticeable, I was curious what they were going to do about it because three things were happening at once. Audiences were getting less numerous, they were getting older, so the youngest traders went away, and levels of trust towards TV were also going down. So again, I was watching for what the, they would do with it. The answer, nothing. They did nothing whatsoever. They did not change the formats or the faces or the topics, although it was evident that people, again, surprising as it may sound now, just didn't care uh, for discussions of the affairs of Ukraine. They didn't care about it even till the end of 2021. And even Donbass was not a thing, not much of a thing. I now suspect that these state TV channels, and as I said, there are no others, were aiming, aiming at an audience of one single person. And so long as he was happy with the agenda and the program and the style, they were just okay. And judging by the uh, amount of money spent on TV by the Russian budget, they were absolutely correct in their policies. But among other people, who were not this one person in an audience, TV ratings went down. So um, this is a long, a long line, almost 10 years. Main sources of information. Where do you get news from uh, about the country and the world? So TV, still number one source of information for the majority of the populace. Make no mistake about it. When we talk about decline, we talk about a real process, real social tendency, but still it is the first. But it's going down. 
the uh, blue line is online editions, online media. Uh, the yellow one, social media. And the red line, telegram channels. Telegram channels went up very much, you see, from 2021 to 2022, they experienced a substantial increase in audiences. Telegram is the Russian political media of choice right now. And as I said, TV is still going down. So this is really the very last thing. That was the last thing, but this is the last, last thing. There is yet another slide after this. Of course, but it's the last one. <laughs> So, why is this important? I was saying that there are two questions we get asked when we talk about... Absolutely, I'm ready to get kicked out, but I will say what I have to say. Uh, so, we have two questions about public opinion in Russia. Can we know it, really, and why is it important? Of course, polling was invented for two categories of people, for the voters, in trying to predict the outcomes of American presidential elections, and for consumers in trying to predict what people would buy. In both cases, you have a person with a choice. He has his vote, he has his dollar or her, can spend it on one type of soap or another, on one candidate or party or another. If a person has no choice, why is his or her opinion important at all? This is a valid question, but even autocracies are not completely divorced from their societies. They try to depoliticize people, but still they have to keep a certain connection with the majority. Uh, there's a magic figure in social sciences saying that there's such a thing as loyalistic core. The core electorate or just people who support the status quo because it's a status quo. Again, the magic figure is the assumption is that if you have it at the rate of 30% or higher, your society is stable. If it goes below 30%, then you are in for trouble. Maybe you are in for a glorious transformation, progress, whatever, but still you are in for some instability. This slide shows the results of a poll done by an Institute of Sociology of the Russian Academy of Sciences. By the way, they do very good surveys. They do not ask people questions about news of the week, which is good, but they do lengthy, detailed surveys, and these are published out in the open. I love them very much. So, this is the change from 2014 to 2018 in the answers to the questions, what values should Russia's future be based upon? So, it's a very fundamental question. What, is, what are the important values that should characterize the future of the country? So number one, social, ah, and now comes this difficult Russian word, справедливость. <laughs> ha. Sometimes it's justice, sometimes it's mercy, sometimes it's equality, and sometimes it's exception. Sometimes it's keeping to the law, sometimes it's making an exception of the law. We, all Russian speakers, we know at every given moment what is справедливо and what is not справедливо. But it's hard to explain, and I don't think it's that easy to translate. So it's not social equality. Again, sometimes it's not about equality. It's, it's on the opposite about making exceptions. But it's fairness, social fairness. This is answer number one. And look at the growth, 47% in 2014, uh, 59 in 2018. Second, rights, human rights, democracy, freedom, self-expression. 10 percentage point growth in four years. You don't see that every day. Uh, Russia should be the great superpower. Same number of people, no growth. Uh, strong power that can guarantee stable order. Same number of people. Uh, closer relations with the West, 11 and then 14. Free um, market, private economy, minimum um, state involvement in economic activity. 13 to 14, morally stable. Russia for Russians, 10 to 12, a slight growth. Um, nothing of this kind expresses my opinion. That's the last. So by the way, if we look at that, we can perceive what sociologists call the proto-parties, the proto-party groups. If 
in some miraculous case, we had free parliamentary elections. This would be the parties. The social democratic one, the liberal one, the editist one, the conservative traditional one, the nationalist one, the Russian libertarian, and underestimated, by the way, number of people. The Russian libertarianism, it's really quite popular. You don't meddle with me, I don't meddle with you, I don't need anything from the state, leave me alone, and free arms. Again, it's more popular when they think. We cannot, of course, estimate the popularity of these ideas because we do not have a free informational environment, we do not have competition of ideas, we do not have a free public sphere. But these questions, as before real censorship has struck in, are, I think, characteristic. And this is something more new. This is the very last slide. It's absolutely the last. <laughs> even, even if you ask me, well, I do have on this flash drive some more slides, but not in this particular presentation. So. This is Levada asking what political system is best for Russia and presenting only three choices. Red, the Soviet one. Yellow, the present one, the current one. Uh, blue, Western democracy. And these are the ages. 18 to 24, 25, 39, 40, 54, 55 plus our favorite category. So look at that. Soviet system is popular even with the young. We have 30%, which is substantial. The present, not that much. And Western democracy. Even with a hopeless category of 55 plus, it enjoys 9% of popularity. And now for the last phrase on this last slide. And this is, again, the data we are indebted to, uh, we are indebted for to the Institute of Sociology, Russian Academy of Sciences. 2021 won 42% of respondents declared for the democratic political regime. 25, the current one, and 23, the Soviet one, which chimes quite well with the Levada data of 2018. We do not have the figures for 2022. As I said, we are dealing with a society not in its normal state, at the head of its psychosis, I would say, if I would allow myself to say that. But I think these figures deserve at least some consideration. With this, I will end my very lengthy description, but in my defense, I should say that we are describing very complicated and it is. Simplistic answers are unworthy of the scholarship represented by this great and glorious university, which I again thank for the platform given to me. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Ekaterina. Uh, we do have time for some questions. Uh, I suggest we collect questions. We used to have a microphone there, which disappeared. So whoever stole that microphone, please put it back. But there is a microphone above the, for those who are ah, on the, the, the balcony. Yeah. So and I'll I'm, be passing I, the mic. Okay. I'll be passing the mic. Uh, so uh, there is another mic which I'll give to that side. And at the same time, uh, at the same time let's uh, collect questions one by one. Uh, yeah. Okay. There is a line so, of people. So, uh, frank frankly, how much time do we really have? We really have six minutes. So we will <laughs> we collect okay. questions. Uh, uh, so in six minutes, there will be a strong voice of a person who will announce that the building is closing. Um, okay. But uh, uh, so we have, we have the microphone there. We have microphone on, on, on the balcony. And we'll put a second microphone here. So I suggest we take those four questions and see if uh, you can ask very quick questions. And Ekaterina can give. I only answer yes, no, don't yeah, know. That's right. Uh, <laughs> one thing I would like to mention, Ekaterina mentioned that there is a law on foreign agents, which uh, both of us are. And yeah, so uh, uh, if I respected Russian law, I would have said in the beginning that the lecture has been introduced by foreign lecture, uh, agent, uh, and the lecture is delivered by a foreign agent. And, um, and if you, <laughs> if, if by any chance any of you are below 18, you should leave the building immediately and forget everything that you have heard, because we are not allowed to produce content for minors. And whatever we publish has to be labeled 18 plus, like we are producing pornography. 
which for the record we do not, not yet. So now for your question. So this is uh, what would have been said if we respected Russian law. The question, please. Uh, uh, hi, Katerina. Thanks for a fabulous lecture. Uh, uh, I'm uh, representing Association Russie Liberté. The question is, so you uh, painted uh, a picture with uh, uh, rough strokes uh, about many different things. My question is, uh, uh, what do you say about uh, regional differences and whether there, there are uh, revival in uh, interest in uh, ethnic roots uh, and uh, memories, I don't know, Far East Republic or any Siberian uh, uh, entity? And, and, yeah, so. <laughs> so, so we we answer questions as they come, or we uh, collect you can collect. Yes, uh, let's go. Let's go ask these four questions, and you. <laughs> You have a pen, you have a pen, so, yeah. Please try to ask questions uh, in a short form. I'll try quickly. Thank you for the lecture. My question is, uh, first of all, small um, commentary rather than question. Why uh, would you say that approval or the brain is the same as interest? Because they're usually asked in different separate questions. The second one is, if you, why uh, we base the perception of the support of uh, the military operation, the war, on the questions about emotions, when, for example, there is already established methods of how to work with sensitive topics, like survey experiment, which was done, for example, by Max Schaub, I think, and he his research was based on the uh, idea of the like, introducing questions, exactly the ones on the support of the war and not emotions. And uh, yeah, I think that is, thank you. Thank you. Ekaterina Mikhailovna, Sergei Maratovich, thank you so much for the lecture. Um, my question is um, on regards to, at the very start of the lecture, you mentioned the difference between autocratic and totalitarian state, and there is uh, no ideology. And my question was that I think many from the state propaganda, and you've ended up with the media, would argue because they are working very hard to make people believe that there is one. So my question is whether you think that there's a tr transitional moment from autocracy to totalitarian totalitarian regime, sorry, or the state is just delusional and it's just a temporary thing and once the regime is gone, we would actually reveal that there is no real support or any political agenda. Thank you. I basically just got on the line to say thank you as well. No, actually, um, I have a question which is potentially problematic and there's no easy answer, I think, but I really would like to hear what you think. Do you believe that there's any way in which the West could support the development of democracy in Russia real, realistically? That's so, all, that's my question. So let's start with these four simple questions. Uh, um, if people need to leave, please feel free to, uh, feel free, free to leave. Uh, yeah, before but, it's too late, yeah. while the building is yet open. Uh, so, just peanuts. Sure. Uh, regional differences uh, and uh, any interest in uh, ethnic and territorial uh, heritage and roots. Very good question. Uh, the thing is, in recent years in Russia, before the war uh, and before any militarization of, uh, at least of public sphere, uh, these regional associations, regional uh, identities, started to develop and to gather strength for a number of very different reasons. And this is one of the signs you, that characterize real social tendencies, is that they do not, they do not come from one single source or from, for, from one single player or actor, but seemingly disconnected factors all feed into them. So there was the decline of popularity for central powers for the president after 2018. I have mentioned it in connection with the Crimean consensus. So there was a slightly more trust in regional and local authorities. People started uh, traveling inside Russia more and the so-called internal tourism developed. It really did. It was until recently a very comfortable country to, to travel in. Um, people were not interested in political agenda, they became interested in something that is closer to them. Urbanization drove uh, all kind of nice urban staff, uh, cities became more comfortable, uh, mayors and the heads of richer regions tried to do this thing called blogustroistva, the betterment, the state gentrification of uh, urban environments. All those things 
kind of fed into making people identify themselves with their locality rather than with the country in general. And then came the war. By the way, those tendencies were strengthened during pandemic because during pandemic people started to trust local authorities more than federal, or at least, to be more exact, local authorities experienced an increase in trust and federal decrees. And again, they could only travel inside the country, not outside, which fed again into this same tendency. So you see, this is the sign. Everything, the bad and the good, the war and peace, all feeds into one and the same trend. Uh, the war, of course, increased immediately, drastically increased the interest in the general agenda rather than the local one. At the same time, inequalities, regional inequalities, demonstrate themselves in war also. Poorer, re poorer regions are harder hit by mobilization. More people are conscripted from there. More people are mobilized. More people sign contracts because of money. So there are more deaths in Buratia than in Moscow. So this is more perceptible. Does this lead us into any separatist tendencies? The honest answer would be, first, we do not know. As far as we know, not yet. So long as the federal center has both the carrots and the sticks, the money to buy loyalties and the strength to punish disloyalties, country holds together. But generally speaking, we do not have a lot of things which really unite us. When sociologists try to find out what those things are, which the majority accepts, we really have ridiculously few things. We have Russian language, the school curriculum, some memories commonly recognized quotations from Soviet movies and songs. Uh, the president, he's known to almost everybody. He's been around for a long time. Uh, and two holidays, New Year and um, 9th of May, Victory Day. <laughs> so long, so far, it's enough. But first, it's nothing much. And more tragically, those unifying Symbols belong mostly to the aging generation. The younger societies, well, for them, the movie for the new year is not the irony of fate, but home alone. So in a couple of decades, this post-Soviet unity can very well dissolve, but not now. Uh, the second question was about why uh, do we have to, again, if I understood it correctly, the question was why, why do we uh, pay attention to what people say about their emotions when there are ways to ask them direct questions about their attitude towards the war. Yes, there's, of course, you can ask direct questions, and sociologists do this, but again, if you can get 15 years for, for the wrong answer, this kind of influences those answers. So, as I said, we have to combine different markers, including non-political ones. It is perceivable, it is possible that people who, who say we experience horror, shock, and anxiety do not experience this because of the war, but because of something else. And maybe they are pro-war, they are just anxious and shocked that the war doesn't go successfully enough. This is a possibility. As I said, we are groping in a semi-darkness. But my point is, we cannot just get rid of or afford ourselves to ignore any sort of data. So autocracies have no ideology. Do I think that um, there's an ideology in the making? I must say that there's an opinion among political historians and political scientists that we perceive that totalitarian regimes of 20th century as ideologically complete only in retrospect that we have kind of created those ideologies post factum. And that, for example, the fascist regime, the Nazi Germany, also lived on collection of memes and slogans and bits and extracts from previous history of, of the world, rather than on some complete and harmonious and thorough ideological system. This is the opinion which I have to share with you because it has certain foundations, but still, in totalitarian regimes, you have to have an ideologized organization, a party. You can't do this without a party or some sort of organization that will teach the people this ideology. The thing that we currently have in Russia, which is closest to the sign of totalitarian transformation, is not repression. 
not giving someone 25 years for expressing an opinion, it's a bad thing. But it happens in different political regimes as well. But the closest thing we have to a totalitarian transformation is the attempt to ideologize secondary education. This is really the important thing. Higher education as well, but secondary education is more important. And here, I must say that the factor is time. It is conceivable that if this whole status quo lasts for eight years or 10 years, if it manages to educate one course of school from first grade to 10th grade in this environment, to teach them those snatchers of quasi-ideology, to accustom them that the world is like that, that this is normal, then they may both educate not just the new generation of citizens, but the new generation of bureaucrats, of administrators who will know no other reality but this one, and they may come up with an ideology of sorts. So simplistic as it may sound, here time indeed as a, is a factor. I cannot say how much time do you need to spoil a nation in this way. I do not know. I, being a teacher myself, I tend to think in terms of school years. So for me, 10 years seems to be a very good stretch of time. But of course, it's just an assumption. Fourth question, uh, how could West support uh, democracy in, in Russia? Uh, again, very simple question. Uh, read the answer in, in our new book, Know How. No way. Uh, again, for every country, especially such a large country as Russia, the internal factors are of paramount importance. The country is important to itself, much more than anything outside is important to it. So, I do not know what the West can do right now. Military action is important, but I cannot be the judge of that, because that's not my kind of thing. I know that autocracies can survive military defeat and not lose power, or they can lose power as a result of a military defeat. We have examples both ways. Many examples. On one hand, on the other hand, as the saying is. But what I do know is that the key factor leading towards military aggression is isolation. Or, how is it called in a Russian uh, public discourse, sovereignty. Sovereignty is the enemy of peace, or so it would seem. So if we do get a second chance in this century, then we should, from both sides, try to include, uh, unveil, and mesh. How do, you, how do you put it? Um, Russia into the system of international law, international political constraints, international unions, and guarantees. I do not know how the system should look. Again, it's not my kind, kind of thing. What new United Nations organizations, what new, I don't know, global policing should emerge in order to, in simple terms, limit the extent to which a country can try to become a law unto itself. So each step towards isolation is a step towards a future aggression, internal and external. I know that there's an opposite logic. We have tried to include Russia, but it didn't work. We just poisoned ourselves with corrupt Russian money, etc. Again, I do not deal with foreign policy or international relations. I would suspect that economic inclusion, economic integration is not enough. Political and military and law enforcement, especially law enforcement and lawmaking, legislative integration is more essential. Fortunately, uh, people used to deal with this problem before. There was the father of the new German constitution, Karl Löwenstein the lawyer who spent more than 10 years in exile in the United States. He left in 1933, and he returned in, I think, June or July uh, 1945 on the smoking ruins of Berlin, and he conducted, among other things, illustration of judges. 
he, he had Carl Schmitt arrested. Some of you uh, may be familiar with the name of the famous philosopher, the, the fascist uh, theorist. So, he wrote the new constitution for the Federal Republic of Germany. Uh, he came up with the conception of so-called militant democracy, the democracy that can defend itself. So, not going into too much detail, because this is very much my kind of thing, constitutional composition, lawmaking, the most engaging things in the world. So, no constitution can defend itself. It's just paper and letters. But there are certain mechanisms, let's put it like this, that make authoritarian transformation more difficult. So if we do get a second chance, we should come prepared and international society should really help. We may not call it integration, we may call it constraining. I don't care which way, but we should be mindful of the direction. And the direction is, is quite simple. The more you isolate yourself, the more dangerous you are, both to your own citizens, to your own citizens first, and to your neighbors second. Thank you. Uh, I, I suggest we take two last questions, one from the balcony and uh, one from this microphone. Is there a question on the balcony? There was a microphone there? No. Uh, no. Okay, then last question from here. Thank you, <clears throat> Yekaterina and Sergei, for this lecture. A quick question. Um, so there's this uh, often cited by you, uh, Ronald Englehart's modernization theory that says there are, that there are uh, emancipative values and self-expression values, and uh, according to the WVS polls, uh, Levada, uh, the youngest Russians, from the youngest adult Russians from 18 to 24, are those who hold the strongest emancipation emancipative values. And according to Levada poll from 2021, the majority of them, 53%, accepted homosexuality, for example, which is a very strong indicator of. Uh, emancipative values and uh, appreciation of democracy. So, um, and the uh, the theory goes that there are there is this brainwashing cultural heritage, brainwashing in schools, uh, universities. But at the same time, there is prolonged economic stability, uh, which uh, kind of eliminates the other influences. Or um, so my question is that do you think that the emancipative drive that um, youngest Russian adults have will persist through the war and through the political repression and brainwashing uh, and eventually lead to democratization uh, or not? And what are factor, factors influencing, influencing each outcome? Thank you. This is a yes no question. Oh, yes, certainly. Uh, that, that's, that's the simplest one that has been asked so far. Uh, but it's a good, that's a good question for, for the conclusion of our very intense uh, discussion. Ah, to come straight to the point, we do have highly recognizable generational differences in opinion on every subject, political or non-political. We have, roughly speaking, three generational stratas active on the social scene. We could call them grandparents, parents, and children. The 60 plus, the 40 plus, and the 20 plus. The differences between 60 plus and everybody else are stronger than between 40 plus and 20 plus. So it's the conflict between the grandparents and everybody else. Although there are differences between the 40 something and the 20 something, but they have more in common. But the grandparents, they just evidently came out of space. Actually, they did not come out of space. This is the generation born in the 50s, the Soviet baby boomers, the last present of Soviet regime to humanity. They are the people who were 40 or slightly younger in 1991. They were at their most active in the 90s. They were the 90s. And they are the ones most apt to scare the new generations with the memory of these years. Do you really want it to happen like when we were young and were running things? No, you don't, because it was truly horrible. However, uh, returning to the question itself. So, we do have people age 20 and even age 40 plus who hold to the values of modernization and self-expression rather than um, safety and conservation in, in terms of Inglehart, in terms of World Values Survey. But the drama is, we have so few young people. Look at Russia's demographic pyramid, which is my favorite picture, I meditate on it. 
It doesn't look like a pyramid at all. It looks like a Christmas tree that has seen better times. <laughs> so we have a gap, a gap, and a gap every 25 years. <laughs> even, even my limited French allows yeah, me to understand translate, yeah, they just translated that they, into we English. have outstayed our welcome. So, we, yes or no? Again, I'm. I'm a, yeah. <laughs> Uh, let us leave this question partly unanswered for the next installment of the same, hopefully. This is how I'm trying to inveigle myself into being, into being invited the second time.